Okay, so in the prior video we have introduced elementary concepts in UV spectroscopy. Uh, now we move on to trying to understand the selection rules in that spectroscopy. Okay, so again, uh, in UV spectroscopy what you're doing is promoting electronic transitions. Okay, so if you think about a molecule, in general a generic molecule, uh, that molecule is going to have uh, uh, orbitals, molecular orbitals that are bonding, and molecular orbitals that are anti-bonding. Okay? Uh, so, uh, usually the bonding orbitals are fully occupied and the anti-bonding orbitals are unoccupied, uh, even though that's not general, but, but this is what represents reality uh, more closely. Okay, so uh, talking about the selection rules, uh, we ask the question of what is the gross selection rule and what is the specific selection rule. Okay, so the gross selection rule is fairly simple for UVBs. In UV spectroscopy, uh, uh, it turns out that every single molecule absorbs. If you have a covalent bond, you're always going to have a set of at least sigma bonding uh, orbitals and uh, some sigma star antibonding orbitals. So you can actually always promote that transition. Okay, so every single species uh, absorbs in the UVBs. And this is a problem uh, because um, uh, your sample will have some transitions, but then the solvent in which you're dissolving your sample will also have transitions. And the walls of the cuvette where you're holding the uh, sample and the solvent Okay, will also have transitions. Okay, so uh, this is kind of a liability of UVBs or a disadvantage because again, uh, many of the transitions that you're going to be observing will overlap. Okay, uh, so well, when you think about a spectrum, uh, how this looks like, okay, uh, this is where you plot absorbance or intensity as a function of the wavelength. Okay, if the wavelength grows in this direction, it turns out that here we have high energy transitions and here we have low energy transitions. Okay, so again, uh, uh, because everything has, uh, uh, every single molecule, however simple you can think of, is going to have at least a sigma bonding orbital and a sigma anti-bonding orbital, okay, then everything is going to absorb in this region of uh, uh, high energy. Okay, let's think about a very simple molecule. We're going to talk here about a, a hydrocarbon, say, uh, CR, R prime, then H, and then CH, H, H. Okay, again, this is a very simple molecule, but here you'll have uh, a sigma bond, sigma bond, sigma bond. When you look at the molecular orbital for this complicated molecule, there's going to be a, a set of sigma bonding orbitals and a set of sigma antibonding orbitals. And again, you're going to be able to promote electronic transitions uh, in between these two. But usually what happens is that the gap in energy between the sigma, the sigma stars is actually pretty high, right? So you will actually be in this region of the spectrum. And this is the region of the spectrum where, where uh, if you dissolve this in um, an apolar solvent, like for example hexane, hexane will have a very similar set of uh, sigma and sigma star orbitals. So again, uh, I trust that, that both your sample and the solvent will absorb right here. It will be very difficult to tease out uh, what is the signal coming from your sample versus the solvent. What is more, if you're using a plastic cuvette, that plastic is going to have chemistry very similar to this, which means that the molecular orbital diagram will look uh, very similar to this, and you will also have their absorption, absorption from uh, the cuvette. Okay, so it turns out that, well, sure, everything absorbs in the UVBs, but uh, if you're interested in sigma to sigma star transitions, then those are actually uh, not going to be very useful because everything absorbs in that region. What is useful is when you actually have uh, pi type electrons, okay, because what just generally happens is that you're going to have uh, pi orbitals and pi star orbitals, okay, whose gap is actually closer in energy, okay, this energy gap is actually much smaller for pi to pi star transitions than from sigma to sigma star. Okay, so when you go to the spectrum again, this will be the, the region where the sigma to sigma star transitions are very high energy, and again, everything absorbs, so you will have very high absorbance right here. Okay, but then if your molecule has a pi bond, so for example, we can turn this into the following, okay, now you're actually going to have pi electrons. When you look at the molecular orbital diagram, what you will happen is that now you, uh, you're opening up the possibility for pi to pi star transitions. Again, now the energy gap is much smaller, which means that the wavelength of the photon that you need to shine increases, and that is going to appear in a region of the spectrum that is very clean. Okay, so now you dissolve this in, say, a hexane. Hexane doesn't have any pi electrons, so you will not have any absorptions of the pi to pi star, okay, um, uh, from the solvent. If you pick your cuvette uh, uh, wisely, for example, you can use quartz. Okay, quartz doesn't have, doesn't have or silica doesn't have any 
any pi electrons, okay, that, that overlap with, uh, with this. Okay, so again, you can uh, uh, very carefully, yes, uh, bring pi to pi transitions to a clean region of the spectrum where you can really see uh, uh, absorbance from the molecules that you're interested in. Okay, so uh, this seems to be a little bit uh, limiting because uh, there are molecules that don't have any, any pi electrons, but for the life sciences, uh, we can actually uh, cover our bases quite well. For example, when you think about proteins, uh, uh, it turns out that there's three amino acids that have uh, uh, pi aromatic clouds. Okay, those are biptophan, tyrosine, and phenylalanine. Those three have aromatic uh, side chains. Okay, and that means that they will have a set of pi to pi star transitions. So those are the ones that you generally study uh, when you take give you spectra of proteins uh, in solution. Okay, when we think about DNA, uh, uh, UV spectroscopy, well, DNA has the conjugated base pairs. Okay, so those base pairs that are conjugated also have pi electrons, and then you're studying the transitions from the pi to the pi star orbitals of those electrons. And then all, the reason for all that is that because you actually have their, uh, uh, those pi to pi star transitions appear in a very clean region of the spectrum where the solvent and the cuvette are actually not going to uh, absorb. Okay, uh, for proteins, uh, going back to proteins, we also have that uh, you can see the carbonyl uh, transition. Okay, notice how uh, if you think about the peptide bond, okay, R, R prime, okay, this is also something that we call a chromophore, okay, that absorbs in a clean region of the spectrum. Okay, there's actually something interesting about the molecular orbital picture of this. Um, uh, of this species, and that is that the transition that you actually observe is not pi to pi star. Instead, actually, it turns out that the lowest energy transition is from the non bonding electrons, those lone pairs, to the pi star. Okay, so carbonyls, aside from having pi, uh, or, or this, this peptide one, aside, aside from having a pi to pi star transition, also has uh, an n okay, orbital, which means non bonding orbital, uh, and you can actually promote uh, those electrons from these lone pairs to uh, a pi star uh, antibody orbital. Okay, so again, uh, uh, these discussions are already telling you that, well, uh, GVVs uh, seems to be a not very selective spectroscopy. If you actually are very careful, uh, then you can start to study transitions in a clean region of the spectrum, and those are going to be the type, usually pi to pi star or n to pi star, where um, n would be a non-bonding orbital. Okay, so uh, this settles the discussion about the growth selection rule, what absorbs, and what transitions that you're interest, interested in. We still have to talk about the specific selection rules. Okay, so in this discussion, uh, we actually have said that, well, we're looking at sigma to sigma star transitions, and then pi to pi star transitions, perhaps n to pi star transitions. Okay, so uh, the question is, well, I mean, aside from those, sigma to sigma star, pi to pi star, n to pi star, can we actually have a transition from, say, sigma to pi star, or pi to sigma star? And it turns out that the specific selection rule, uh, when you try to solve the transition that belong an integral, uh, it tells you that uh, those sigma to pi star transitions and the pi to sigma star transitions, those are actually forbidden. Okay, those are not allowed, and uh, you never see those in the UV uh, spectroscopy in, in the spectrum. Okay. So again, that is the gross, and now uh, the specific selection rule. There's one more uh, specific selection rule that we have to talk about carefully, and that is the spin selection rule. Okay, something that uh, uh, is very important uh, for you to recognize is that uh, when the electronic promotion takes place, okay, so I'm going to uh, draw it here for these pi to pi star uh, orbitals. Okay, that is your pi, and this is your pi star. Okay, so the situation would be you take uh, this electron and then uh, promote it to the excited state, so that leaves this electron behind. Okay, the spin of the electron ha that has been promoted to a high energy orbital actually doesn't change. That is the spin selection rule. The spin cannot change, right? So you can't go from a situation in which you have the two spins paired in this orbital to a situation in which the spins would be uh, parallel. Okay, they're not paired, but they're parallel. This can happen that uh, would seem to indicate that the spin, that the electron has flipped the spin did the transition, but that cannot happen. That is not allowed. Okay, so again, uh, the spin uh, selection rule uh, uh, indicates that the spin cannot change 
did an electronic transition. Okay, so this uh, concludes the uh, a little video on uh, the selection rules and the type of transitions that you observe in UVB's spectroscopy.